It is a delight, actually, to introduce our speaker to you. Not that he needs much of an introduction, really. I think he's well known here. I do want to mention some of the positions he currently holds. Uh, he is a clinical ethicist at Fletcher Allen Healthcare in Burlington, Vermont. He is a professor of family medicine at University of, of Vermont College of Medicine. He is an adjunct professor here at Loma Linda University in the uh, family medicine department. He is a visiting professor of bioethics at Trinity International University and a professor of bioethics at the Graduate School of Union University and most recently, I believe, most recently, a consultant on clinical ethics at the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity. One of the delightful ways that uh, we get to introduce him is to show you pictures of him through the years. Uh, he joined us some time ago and shared these pictures and we actually saved them. So just a short stroll down memory lane for uh, Dr. Orr before we give him the <laughs> podium today. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Orr. <laughs> and I think we're up to date now. So thank you very much, Dr. Orr, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to your talk, focusing in on uh, medical mistakes. Thank you. Thank you. And it tru truly, truly, truly is a delight to be back. I mean, all speakers say it's nice to be here. Well, it's really nice to be here. I spent 10 wonderful years uh, here on campus and in the vicinity and come back whenever I get the opportunity. So today we're supposed to talk about medical mistakes, at least the ethical issues involved. So William Osler is one of my heroes in medicine. Uh, <clears throat> I went to McGill University and he was on faculty there, not while I was there, but before he went to Hopkins, he, he taught there. And he talked about medical mistakes. He said, more than any other professional man, the doctor has a curious sensitiveness to personal error, too often accompanied by a cocksureness of opinion, which leads him to so lively a conceit that the mere suggestion of a mistake under any circumstances is regarded as a reflection on his honor, a reflection equally resented, whether of lay or professional origin. So a, a century ago, it was clear that error in medicine was problematic. So what are the ethical issues in relation to medical error? Well, first is whether to disclose the error. So let me ask you, should you disclose an error? Yes, I heard that, yes. So are there any other questions? If not, thank you very much. <laughs> well, but disclosure of error presents a problem. So how do we resolve problems? Well, sharpen your pencils, because here's a quick way to um, solve problems. <clears throat> Is it working? Yes? Well, don't mess with it. No problem. If it's not working, the question is, did you mess with it? If the answer is yes, you're an idiot. And does anybody else know? No? Well, hide it. No problem. If somebody else does know, you're toast. And if you didn't mess with it, well, will it blow up in your hands? No? Then look the other way. No problem. And if it will blow up in your hands, you're toast. But the final question is, can you blame somebody else? No? You're toast? Yes, no problem. <laughs> so there's how we solve problems in ethics. <clears throat> so what are the other ethical issues in relation to medical error? Why to disclose or not disclose? And that's really the nubbin of what we're going to talk about today. And then we're going to spend a few minutes talking about how to disclose. <clears throat> so I'd like to try to define medical error, talk briefly about whether to disclose, then the why to disclose or not, potential harms and benefits from disclosure, some data in relation to medical error, professional position statements on disclosure, and then how to disclose. What is an error? I mean, it seems fairly intuitive that we should know what an error is, but there are many definitions. I'm going to share just two, and they focus differently on judgment about the decision or about the consequences. For example, Dr. Wu, who was writing back in 1997, <clears throat> said that Commission or omission 
with potentially negative consequences for the patient that would have been judged wrong by skilled or knowledgeable peers at the time it occurred, independent of whether there were any negative consequences. So this definition is talking primarily about judgment, a little bit about consequences. On the other hand, <clears throat> the Institute of Medicine released a very influential report in 2000 called To Air is Human, in which they reported the astounding figure that between 44,000 and 96,000 patient deaths per year result from medical error. This was contested, challenged, talked about a lot for years to come. Their definition of error is the failure <clears throat> of a planned action to be completed as intended or the use of a wrong plan to achieve an aim. So this is focused primarily on consequences, less so than on judgment. And it's important to distinguish, I think, between system errors and individual errors. System errors are due to flaws in the systems of practice. The system sets up the physician to make errors by poor design. Just a um, minor example, when there are two drugs that have very similar names, it's not infrequent that those get confused, either in the writing or the transcribing or the um, verbal transmission. System error. Individual errors, on the other hand, are due to deficiencies in physician knowledge, skill, or attentiveness, and they may be just slips, and they may be rule-based errors or knowledge-based errors. And you may notice the citation here from Lucian Leap, and um, uh, he will appear prominently on several different slides because he's sort of the guru of uh, error in medicine. So let's move on to whether to disclose. <clears throat> Let me tell you a story. A 52-year-old woman who uh, said that she was one of Jehovah's Witnesses came to a hospital where I was doing ethics consultations for an elective hysterectomy because she had huge, painful, bleeding fibroids. And she was slightly anemic when she was admitted. In talking with the resident who was admitting her, she said that she was one of Jehovah's Witnesses and refused blood products. He asked her if she would accept autologous blood. If she gave her own blood into the blood bank, would she accept that? And said, no, that too was against the tenets of the faith. So he wrote in the chart, <clears throat> patient refuses blood uh, on religious grounds. Then he went to clinic and the patient went to the operating room. The attending gynecologist did read the note and um, I'm trying to think of what's on the next. No, let's go back just a minute. And <clears throat> at the time of surgery, opened her abdomen, looked down at the pelvis, and there was just one fibroid, and it was huge. No wonder she was having pain. It really occupied, it was in the lower uterine segment, and it totally occupied the bony pelvis, so there really wasn't any room. And so the junior resident or medical student was retracting the uterus to the side, and the surgeon was operating down in, in the crevasse and severed the uterine artery. She was was quickly in shock. The surgeon asked the anesthesiologist to give volume expanders and she called for help. A more senior surgeon came in and said, why isn't she getting blood? Said she, the surgeon said she's refusing blood on religious grounds. And the more senior surgeon said, well, she's not gonna die on my shift and he ordered some O negative blood and saved her life. Then three days later, they asked for an ethics consult saying, should we tell her? What do you think? Should we tell her? I hear only mumbles. Oh, there you are, you are. That light's kind of bright, so I want to just be sure you're here. <laughs> so you think she should be told? Well, <clears throat> the possible answers are yes, no, or it depends. And I had an interesting conversation with the surgeon, the gynecologist, and with her resident and the medical students on the service at that time. And usually when I do ethics consults, I'm fairly tactful and say, well, it would be ethically permissible to do this or to do this, but not to do that. In this case, I was really very uh, directive. She must be told. Well, why must she be told? <clears throat> well, there are reasons based on virtue. There are reasons based on principle. There are reasons based on consequence. And there are reasons based on moral sentiment, both for and against telling her. <clears throat> Let's review these briefly. Virtue-based reasons really 
obligates one to tell because the physician has an obligation to tell. It's part of the profession, goes to the territory. There really isn't any argument about that. Principle-based reasons to tell, well, she has a right to know. A, a principle-based reason to not tell, well, the maxim to first of all do no harm. And maybe it will be harmful to her if she is told that she had a transfusion. So there's some balance there. Consequence-based reasons. Well, what if she finds out, you know? She might sue us. If she gets billed for the blood or eventually develops hepatitis or HIV or somebody slips and mentions the blood transfusions. These are what I called cover your assets reasons. Uh, <clears throat> and there are consequence-based reasons to not tell. It might be detrimental to her sense of eternal well-being. And, of course, she might sue us for unlawful touching or breach of contract. What about the moral sentiment-based reasons to tell? Well, the physician would feel guilty not telling. Uh, to not tell, well, the physician is scared to tell. It's really hard to do. So you remember Watergate? Some of you are old enough to remember Watergate. Poor individual judgment, mistake or crime or sin, depending on how you describe it. Discovery, cover-up, public judgment. What's the, letter, the lesson from Watergate? The cover-up is worse than the original sin. And I, do, I don't use that term in the theological sense, but in, in the uh, secular sense. <clears throat> so when I met with this small group of, uh, of um, surgeon, resident, medical students, we talked about the pros and cons of whether to tell or not. And I was really, really disappointed that the primary reasons they gave for telling were the consequential reasons. Well, we might get caught. And that's true, but it really isn't as high and lofty as I had hoped that they would, uh, that they would think. So what happened in this case? Well, <clears throat> I made it clear to the uh, attending surgeon that she needed to tell the patient. And I, I went with her when she told the patient. She was, and she was so gentle and so um, compassionate. Um, <clears throat> And she took a Polaroid pictures of the surgical specimen and showed them to the patient and said, this is what happened. And the patient said four things in response, four things that I'll never forget. The first thing she said was, thank you for saving my life. By the way, when she was told, she started crying, weeping, wailing. She, but she said, thank you for saving my life. Then she asked, will I get any diseases from the blood? Because part of the teaching is, their interpretation of scripture is Jehovah said thou shalt not because of consequences. The third thing she said began to hurt a little bit. She said, I didn't think you'd do that to me. I went to another hospital and they wouldn't agree to operate unless I agreed to accept blood. So I left there and came here. Told you I didn't want blood. I didn't think you'd do that to me. But the fourth thing she said kept me awake that night. She said, you don't understand. When the resurrection comes, I'm going to stay dead. What an awful future to look forward to. Now, I don't agree with that interpretation of Scripture, but she did, and she looked forward to this eternal separation from Jehovah. Um, <clears throat> and as a consequence, I learned a lot from her and, and had further conversations with the Jehovah's Witness community and so on. Um, so I still think she should be told, um, but you can see from that that there are pros and cons to telling. So what are the potential harms and benefits from disclosure? <clears throat> Lucian Leap again <clears throat> talks about benefits and harms to both the patient and to the physician. So what might be some benefits to the patient? Well, the patient might obtain timely and appropriate treatment for whatever went wrong. Or there might be uh, a, appropriate monitoring to prevent further harm. Might prevent needless worry when the patient has a thorough understanding of what happened. Provide them with information to make informed decisions. Allow the patient just compensation. I mean, some mistakes justify compensation in one form or another. And finally, it might promote trust in the physician and the care system to, to understand that these people are willing to be honest and open, forthright with them. So those are the potential benefits to the patient. What about harms for the patient? 
Well, it can be scary and, and uh, alarming and discouraging for the patient to understand that while they were under anesthesia or whatever, um, something wrong, something went wrong. In fact, it might diminish their faith and confidence in the, in the physicians, leading them to decline further beneficial treatment. Or it might create an unwelcome confusion in the patient who would rather not know what had happened. What about benefits to the physician? <clears throat> Relief. Uh, from the admission, from asking forgiveness, from receiving ab absolution, this may remove some of the, patient, the physician's uh, dire feelings about this event. It may strengthen the patient-physician relationship based on, on truth-telling, uh, faithfulness. It may diminish the chance for a liability claim. We'll come, come back to that in a few minutes. And the physician may learn and improve the practice directly and even vicariously from knowledge of others' errors. What about harms of disclosure to the physician? Well, it hurts, it's bad, it's awful, it's stressful. The physician may fear increased professional liability from divulging that this error took place. And consequently, loss of referrals, privileges, credentials, insurance, license, and damage to their professional reputation by having a, a report made to the National F Practitioner Data Bank. So since I'm implying that there are pros and cons, even though <clears throat> in essence we should disclose, um, when might it be okay to not disclose an error? Well, <clears throat> if there's a good outcome in spite of the mistake. This is sort of the refrain I get from many, many students. Well, no harm, no foul. Is that, is that adequate justification? Thank you for that. Well, I said, first I say yes, in some cases. Uh, <clears throat> for instance, if a physician orders a sulfa product for a patient with a known sulfa allergy, and this is caught by the nurse or the pharmacist, it's not given and so on, an error was made, it was caught before there was any uh, contact with the patient, you probably don't need to disclose that. But in general, no, that's not justification. For example, if a patient sustains a lacerated liver during surgery, and it's repaired, no transfusions required, the surgeon might be tempted to say, no harm, no foul. But I sincerely believe that we have an obligation to let the patient know what has happened because of uh, potential consequences down the road and so on. Or what about the situation where <clears throat> um, there is a poor outcome, but not as a result of the error? For example, in the, in the ER, a uh, patient comes in with multiple trauma, and no cervical collar had been put on in the field for some reason, um, which is a serious error. But the patient died in the operating room from a ruptured liver and spleen. Does the family need to be told that the collar was not put on? Not really relevant to the outcome. Um, and so you might be able to justify not telling in a situation like that. So let's look at some data <clears throat> about medical error. James Burnett is an um, ethicist, neurologist at uh, Dartmouth, and he and a medical student uh, did a survey of 50 students, 50 residents, and 50 staff physicians, asking if they would disclose a relatively minor error, and 96% said they would. 78% said they would disclose even if it leads to death, so it's no longer a minor error, but a, a major error. Um, however, 17% of those said they would disclose only if they were asked. But the reasons they give for disclosure are quite uh, laudatory. It's important to tell the truth and the patient has a right to know. I think that's really the, the bottom line of this discussion. They go on to ask <clears throat> uh, about whether the individual they were talking with would disclose the error made by another physician. And all of them were much, much less likely to disclose. 18% would, 25% might say something well, an earlier diagnosis might have helped and 54% would disclose only if they were asked directly. And the reasons they gave for that <clears throat> are understandable. Uh, uncertainty of what actually happened, it's, it's hard to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Uh, unwillingness cr to criticize another physician, I don't think that holds much moral weight. Maintain collegiality, um, but probably the strongest one was there but for the grace of God, go I. Wu did a survey um, 
in the early 1990s asking house officers how they coped with their mistakes. They surveyed 254 house officers uh, anonymously. 45% <clears throat> reported that they had made a mistake, thus 55% lied, uh, since we all know that we all make mistakes. <clears throat> Maybe they hadn't been doing it long enough to accumulate any significant mistakes. But interestingly, those who cope by accepting responsibility they made more constructive changes in their practice, but they experienced more emotional distress. Whereas those who cope by escape, avoidance, denial, pretending it didn't happen, they made more defensive changes in their practice, and they experienced less emotional distress, which would sort of argue for not disclosing. <clears throat> Let me give you a, an example from my own experience, not exactly related to mistakes, but I think it illustrates this point. When I was doing family medicine in Vermont back oh, 75 or 80 years ago, or however long it was, <clears throat> um, I was sued for malpractice by a, uh, by a patient. And um, it took four years to go through the system, went to the jury, and, and they said no, no fault, no money exchange hands or anything, which was fine. But during that four years of really unsettled time, there were two other physicians in my community who are also being sued for different reasons. One of them was a radiologist, one was an ear, nose, and throat physician. And I used to go by and talk with the radiologist periodically, and we would commiserate and share the process, what we're going through, how we're feeling, and so on. We really agonized over this. Did we make a mistake? Did we honestly make a mistake or not? Uh, we hurt. In fact, he got professional counseling because he was so distressed. And we often remarked that the ENT physician, it was just like water off a duck's back, didn't seem to bother him at all. And finally, as we talked about it, we realized that he and I, the radiologist and I, really cared about our patients and cared about our professional reputation. And the ENT physician had a, had a reputation of being very cold, uncaring, um, and so it didn't bother him. So I think the downside is that the more you care, the more committed you are to your profession, the more it's gonna hurt when these things happen. It goes with the territory. But I think it speaks for accepting responsibility. <clears throat> Laura Kaljian did a survey. It was published just a couple months ago trying to find out if faculty and resident physicians discussed their medical errors with each other. And they sur surveyed 338 <clears throat> internal medicine residents and faculty and found out that 73% usually discuss errors with their colleagues. And of these... 77% if there was no harm, 87% if there was minor harm, and 94% if there was major harm. So they really do want to talk with each other, even though your attorney says, don't talk to anybody about this. Um, we do. And why? Because 91% wanted to know if, if a colleague would have done the same as they had. 80% wanted the colleague to learn from my mistake, and 79% wanted to receive support. Do patients want to know? This one's pretty easy, but there is some, some data to uh, <clears throat> uphold this. Uh, and this first study was done right next door at the VA hospital here in Loma Linda a few years ago. Found out that <clears throat> they surveyed 149 outpatients, and 98% of them wanted acknowledgement of even minor errors. Now, 14% said they would request transfer to another physician. 65% oh, for after a minor error, 65% would request transfer after a major error. But the most important thing learned from this study, 70% of the patients were more likely to pursue litigation if the physician did not disclose. So revealing mistakes, talking with the patient, trying to work through it, trying to uh, reach adequate just, um, compensation and so on, would markedly decrease the number of malpractice suits. Another study <clears throat> trying to determine if patients want to know, and this one was done in 2002, two years after the Institute of Medicine report, which had suggested some type of uh, uh, <clears throat> compulsory reporting mechanism. And 258 uh, emergency department patients were given a 12-item survey, and it was very clear they wanted immediate full disclosure, and they went on to reveal <clears throat> that 92% thought a government agency should be informed, 97% said the state medical board, and 99% said a hospital committee. So they wanted, patients wanted the error to be disclosed to them and to somebody else with authority over the physician. 
This was an interesting and disheartening study <clears throat> that was published again after the IOM report, looking at both patients' and physicians' attitudes regarding the disclosure of medical error. And the patients want disclosure of all errors, what happened, why it happened, uh, what, how the consequences will be mitigated, how recurrences will be prevented, uh, emotional support from the physician, including an apology. The physicians, on the other hand, agreed, first off, that harmful errors should be disclosed, but then they, their, their in inclination was to be a spin doctor, to choose their words carefully, avoiding such things as saying an error occurred or why it happened or how recurrences will be prevented. Uh, <clears throat> and they were disinclined to apologize, fearing that this might create liability. That's a big concern. Uh, if you make an error, if you tell a patient, are they going to sue you? Well, interestingly, this has been recognized by state legislatures as a potential problem. So that 35 states, including California and Vermont, where I practice, have enacted laws making apologies inadmissible in court. So there's at least one layer of protection there. Uh, federal legislation to the same end was proposed, but it, it died in committee. Now let's look at the consequences. Does disclosure pay off? Interesting study done at another VA hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, first off, the VA system, the whole system, has a policy of early injury review, maintenance of relationship with the patient, not just walking away from them, proactive full disclosure, offering fair compensation, claims assistance, and so on. And the VA hospital in Lexington decided to study this and see does it make a difference. And so in seven years, that hospital paid out 88 claims an average of 15,600 each. But the estimated cost of defense of those cases was $225,000 per case. So the hospital figures they saved a bundle by <clears throat> following the policy of early full disclosure. A poll was done in Colorado of both public opinion and uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, <clears throat> thousand surveys went out to Colorado physicians, a thousand to non-Colorado physicians, and 500 uh, phone surveys to uh, uh, Colorado households to assess the agreement with the conclusions and proposals of the Institute of Medicine report. So this was directly a result of, of that uh, report. 14% of physicians and 19% of the public thought that the estimate of deaths uh, was high, oh, excuse me, was accurate. So most felt that the number was really too high to be believable. Almost a third of physicians and two-thirds of the public said quality of care needs is a problem, uh, that error reduction should be a national policy, according to two-thirds of physicians and 86% of the public. And as far as needing a national agency to oversee this, uh, this problem, only a quarter of physicians thought that, that was a good idea, or as little over half of the public did. And as far as mandatory reporting, 90% of the public thought that was a good idea, and only half of physicians. But looking just at physician responses alone for a moment, <clears throat> physicians felt it's difficult to distinguish between negligence and unintended errors, about 61%. And I think this is an ongoing problem in anybody who practices medicine, thinking, how do you divide, how do you draw that line? And physicians clearly felt that the emphasis in reporting should be non-punitive, as it is in the airline industry. Errors are reported, addressed, fixed, uh, without um, punishment to the people involved. And physicians agree that fear of litigation is a barrier to reporting. <clears throat> then Lucian Leap again uh, wrote five years after the IOM report. And his assessment was that the report has changed the conversation, but change is slow and steady by changing the system. And there's a broad array of stakeholders involved in this conversation. And one of the things he points out is uh, hospital report cards. Hospitals are much more willing now to let the public know about their infection rate, their mortality rate, and so on. And he <clears throat> um, identified several specific safe practices that have been instituted since that report. And I'm not going to go through them, but uh, I said there, these things are now in place. They were not in place before, and they have helped to reduce the error rate. What about professional positions, position statements on disclosure? <clears throat> Well, the AMA had a position, has a position statement. It originated in 94, prior to the IOM report. And they say, situations occasionally occur in which a patient suffers significant medical complications. 
that may have resulted from the physician's mistake or judgment. In these situations, the physician is ethically required to inform the patient of all the facts necessary to ensure understanding of what has occurred. The American College of of Physicians is a a little less forthright, but they say physicians, and again, this was in uh, 98, physicians should disclose to patients information about procedural or judgment errors made in the course of care if such information is material to the patient's well-being. That clause, if, raises uh, a gray curtain. Then they go on to say, errors do not necessarily constitute improper, negligent, or unethical behavior, but failure to disclose them may. The same year as the IOM report, the New York State Medical Society released this statement. Full disclosure is in the patient's best interest. Honesty and apology are ethically obligatory and appropriate. Truth-telling should not be the mark of the heroic physician, but rather a distinguishing feature of all decent physicians. Physicians must continue to act as their patient's advocates, yet recognize their own. So let's talk briefly about how to disclose Eric's, because this is really hard. <clears throat> Lazare had an article in, in JAMA in 2006 outlining four steps. First is acknowledgement that the error has happened, identifying the offender, the details of the offense, the unacceptability of the offense. Then an explanation to the patient or family, <clears throat> and the, <clears throat> recognizing that the explanation may mitigate or aggravate the uh, tension. Um, and the attitude that there is no excuse, uh, and, we're, and sometimes saying we're still trying to figure it out, how it happened, so that we can prevent it again from happening again. And the third step or the third uh, aspect of it is uh, an attitude of remorse, shame, humility, um, and then reparation for the, for the error. When I was teaching an online course for residents here at, at Loma Linda, I suggested four steps. <clears throat> First, again, acknowledgement. The second, uh, repentance and, and, uh, and prevention. I lumped those together. The third, restitution or compensation. And I went on to a fourth one, which I think has a, a biblical basis of restoration of the relationship when that is feasible. Jerry Amori is a colleague of mine from Vermont who uh, has been in risk management for several years. Um, and she helps to educate physicians on many things, including how to disclose errors. So to start with, you've got to know the facts, what happened, know the events, excuse me, the effects, and know who you're talking to. <clears throat> so you don't just walk in blind, you really prepare yourself. And this should be done soon after the event, soon after it was recognized, in a private setting, very much like when you're giving a patient bad news. Private setting, sitting down, beeper off, um, time to talk, and so on. Who should do this? Well, the physician who's responsible. Um, And some people are inclined to take a whole cadre of people with them, the nurse, the social worker, and so on. And Jerry suggests that no more than two healthcare professionals so that the family or patient do not feel overwhelmed. As far as how to do it, it says speak slowly and softly, and that you're part of the message, so body language, leaning forward, and so on. She addresses the question of whether or not you should touch the person, and this is really a very culturally sensitive um, issue uh, and a style issue and really can't give guidelines uh, before the fact. <clears throat> Assess the, patient, the recipient's readiness. I know this whole thing has been trying. Unfortunately, I do have to talk with you now. Is that all right? And what is disclosed? What is said? Well, a mistake was made. Express your concern, your regret, and apology. Investigate the cause. <clears throat> saying we are investigating the cause or uh, it will be investigated. Sometimes the cause is very clear right from the outset, but we shouldn't assume that we know the cause until it's been thoroughly looked at. And inform them what corrective action is going to be taken and what follow-up is necessary. And she suggests using phrases like, I appreciate that you might see it that way. This is assuming that there's some angry response from the patient or family. We should discuss such and such. Use words like accept, acknowledge, plan, concerned, apologize, caring, and so on. And she says to avoid phrases like couldn't possibly, you're mistaken, that can't be done. 
and avoids words like fault, non-negotiable, catastrophe, refuse, impossible, blame, unfair. Um, using terms like, it's okay, it must be difficult for you, what can I do, this must hurt, I appreciate this, we're together on this, tell me, I can see how you can be angry with me. And avoid terms like, don't talk to me like that, um, it's wrong to feel that way, you're wrong, that's the way it is. <clears throat> and uh, try to determine if you're making it clear to the person you're talking with. <clears throat> Instead of saying, do you understand, which sort of puts the onus on the patient, are you smart enough to figure out what I'm saying? No, it's, am I making this clear? It's my responsibility to make it clear. And be prepared for a response, reaction, which may include tears or anger and so on. And the conclusion of the conversation should be a, a summary, a statement of your availability, questions to be answered or investigated, the next contact, and telling the person, we're on the same side. We're trying to work through this. We're trying to make the best of this. And then the, just the humane things of taking care of the person, somebody to be with them. Uh, do you want to see the patient? Uh, ensuring that they have transportation, food, place to stay, and so on. <clears throat> she also talks about how apologies fail. By failing to acknowledge responsibility. That's so important to say, you know, it was my fault. I didn't check the vial before I gave the injection. I didn't check it a second time or whatever. Insincerity will come across very clearly. It lies uh, absolutely <clears throat> unacceptable. Or if the sequence of events doesn't make sense to the person who's hearing this or putting the blame on others when the responsibility really belongs to the individual doing the apology. So in conclusion, if you make an error, tell the patient or family because it's the right thing to do. You have an obligation to do it. It pays off. And how it's done is also important. Now, just for a moment, let's talk about physicians' response to mistakes. <clears throat> Let me tell you about a sad Monday morning when I was chiefing in the family medicine clinic here at, at Loma Linda many years ago. I came in this morning and I saw a resident sitting there with his head in his hands and he looked like he had lost his best friend. And I said, wow, you must have been on call this weekend. And his response surprised me. He says, no, but I wish I had been. He says, tell me, what, what's going on? And um, he said that on Friday afternoon, he had admitted a woman, age 52, with congestive heart failure from his clinic. Then he said this, that he hurried through the evaluation, did the history and physical, wrote the orders, <clears throat> and then he signed out for a weekend off. He was going to go rock climbing. Then he came in on Monday to find out that she died on Sunday of a pulmonary embolus. And he's saying, if I had been more thorough, if I had been more careful, if I had done this, if I had done that, maybe she wouldn't have died. That's heavy. That's really heavy. So what did I say to him? Did I say to err is human? Nope. Did I say don't feel bad? Nope. I said, I have some idea how you feel. I said, let me tell you a story of my own. I was, <clears throat> after my training, I was in practice in the Navy, stationed in Puerto Rico, in clinic one afternoon. One patient didn't show, so I picked up the JAMA journal and opened it. it was just flipping through the pages, and I saw this chest x-ray, and I said, I know that x-ray. This was a patient of mine who had died from an error of mine. And the um, the writer of the article, you can't see his name, <clears throat> Jack Zimmerman, was my senior resident when I was an intern. This man was 48 years old, um, had had Hodgkin's disease for a few years. It had initial chemotherapy, or excuse me, radiation. <clears throat> and then it had some uh, chemotherapy which, to which his malignancy did not respond. And he was back in the hospital for more radiation therapy. He was on my service, going to get the uh, radiation every day, and he developed an ileus. His intestine just stopped moving. And so uh, we're making rounds. The morning this became evident, and the attending physician said, well, you better put a tube in and drain his stomach. So I said, oh, well, I'll put a, an NG tube in right after rounds. He said, no, why don't you do a Miller-Abbott tube? 
a small intestine tube, which is similar to an NG tube, but it has a second um, um, bore through it with a side port in which you can inject mercury, uh, which comes into a little plastic bag to give some weight to the end of the catheter so that it will move through the pylorus into the first part of the small intestine. Because just putting in an NG tube will just pull the gas and fluid out of the stomach, but you really want to go beyond that. I said, well, I've never done that before. And he said, well, it's the same as putting in an NG tube, same technique, and when you're done, you just put some mercury in the side port. So oh, I can do that. So after rounds, I went, and the nurse was helping. I, <clears throat> I put in the uh, tube with no problem and assured of its position. And then I picked up the little bottle of mercury and the syringe, and I said, hmm, I wonder how much you put in there. And I asked the nurse, and she said, oh, about 15 cc's. And I said, well, just to be sure, I'll put in 20. And um, it was fine. Went through the pylorus, deflated the intestines, all was well. The uh, attending physician looked at the x-ray the next day and said, oh, that's, the gas is going down. How much mercury did you put in there? And I said, uh, 20 cc's. He said, oh, five would have been enough. Oh, okay, well, next time I'll just use five. Then a couple of days later, everything was clear. His bowels were moving, and it was time to take the tube out. So I started pulling the tube out, and mm, got stuck. I said, oh, I didn't jerk. I wasn't rough. I just gently pulled on it, and suddenly it came free, and the bag broke, and the mercury was in his airway, and he coughed and aspirated. And several days later, he died of mercury poisoning. Believe me, I didn't sleep well for some time. But I shared with this resident <clears throat> the horror of recognizing that I had made an error that led to a patient's death. And I honestly don't know what the prognosis was for his malignancy, if he could have survived or not. And I, I really don't want to know at this point. Um, but I was able to share that with this resident. And um, just that alone uh, helped. And I talked with him several times over the next few weeks, helped him to cope with this. And, taught him a lot about being conscientious, taking your time, not rushing a patient care for personal pleasure. So I started with Osler. Let's finish with Osler. <clears throat> the wrangling and unseemly disputes that have too often disgraced our profession arise in a great majority of cases. On the one hand, from this morbid sensitiveness to the confession of error, and on the other, from a lack of brotherly consideration and a convenient forgetfulness of our own failings. So with that, I will close and uh, we'll be glad to take questions if there are any. I don't pretend to have any answers, but I'll be glad to address questions. Seeing none, thank you for coming. It's a delight to be here. Thank you.